Bruce, thank you for being on the podcast. There's a, there's a lot that I want to cover, but I have to start out with my first question, which is what's your favorite superhero? Oh man. Uh, you know, it's anyone in spandex cause I like spandex. <laughs> uh, you know, I was asked by a gay friend of mine and, and, and I'm not gay, so I don't know why he's asking me, but he <laughs> said, is there a gay superhero? And I said, no, but there should be one. It, 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 it does a number of things like saves you from inappropriate dinner conversation you were about to make things like this <laughs> totally. so he, thought, he thought that was good to have a gay superhero so i vote for a gay superhero boom okay i'll give it so man so normally i kind of can understand a little bit about someone from the first whatever their superhero is like at least nowadays uh with the prevalence of the movies and everything you can be like oh okay Regardless, I want to kind of journey back into there's there's so many uh, facets and touch points of what you've done to where you are now. And I kind of wanted to move from the, the beginning journeys to how you got to where you are now. Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of starts coming out of the womb, I suppose, or being, <laughs> being, being conceived as a human. Uh, but I was always a in a way, a very trippy kid. Uh, when I was nine, I started this project where uh, every time I would go out and play and have a stimulating day and I would come in to go to bed or to have a nap, I would notice there was these flashes that would go behind my closed eyelids. And I was a science geek even then. So I was like, okay, is my brother shining a flashlight on my face? No. I would open up my eyes and there'd be a dark room. And then I said, well, what can I do with all this? It's very cool. It's very bright. Some of the flashes are bright. So I learned how to minimize myself down to the most minimal observer sphere and so that the system could grow and it would grow into these wash patterns and or fractals. I didn't know what fractals were. This is yeah. 1971. Uh, but then... I noticed that if I just even pulled myself further back so that I didn't have any thinking mind at all, no language, no words, no nothing, just kind of a big emptiness, then they would grow into color and it would resolve into all kinds of worlds. And our neighbors had a color TV down the street, but it was a terrible one. And I figured, well, we don't have a color TV, but this is like color TV. And if I can learn how to manage this i can explore worlds and get better tv than they've got <clears throat> so it became my life's work uh, i have thousands of drawings of these worlds from when i was a teenager and i use this technique which i now call endogenous uh, as opposed to exogenous uh, tripping or visioning or whatever uh, endogenous being made from within mm -hmm. uh, exogenous meaning you take something from without and I used it to design virtual worlds, software, work on the origin of life, work on spacecraft design. And later on, I got attached to people who were working on lucid dreaming and all these things and kind of determined that it was different than lucid dreaming or different than dreaming altogether because it, you know, so this is really the structure and definition of how I work. And I was even going to write a book about it called the little book of endo years ago. And if somebody wants to partner on that, I can, uh, as I'm just so busy, I need like a professional writer to work with and an illustrator, but I put it out there. I, I don't know if it was on Joe Rogan or if it was on somewhere. And all these people started writing saying, I have these experiences too. And endo is characterized by you have an intention for something like I had an intention to see more in these color flashes than I could. And then you're patient. And then usually in a completely waking state, this vision starts to come. And some people reported open eyed versions of it, mathematical worlds, or they're sitting on their bus trip and they're suddenly in the Beatles yellow submarine album fully. Uh, and these people started getting in touch and I started interviewing them and I realized that 
this is probably a, a new modality. It's, it's not lucid dreaming. It's not tri tripping. It's something else. So anyway, that's, I know that was a thing you wanted to talk about right off on the podcast. So I thought I'd just bring that up because it's definitional for how I've gotten my work done. Totally. Yeah. I mean, and how you just brought it up, you're very, <laughs> you're really underplaying the, amazing ability that this has given you in order to kind of like pave the way for things. I mean, designing spacecrafts, creating virtual worlds, like real practical things that I think a lot of people oftentimes like they'd be like, yeah, you're creating something in your mind and it's whatever. You're creating things that are literally paving the way for everything that we understand today as, uh, as is practical as it can get. And you know, Austin, it's accelerating. Um, this is this funny effect is you work for 40 years on something and it pops out one day in an endo trip, which the origin of life did in 2013. I remember the day really well. Uh, Einstein called these thought experiments and, and mm -hmm. he, it led to relativity theory. I mean, he, he was 16 and he had a a waking dream of running alongside a beam of light and then he would see the waves compress and stretch out and sometimes he had another dream where uh, trains were coming together and the light was coming out of one train and the other and he asked the question does does that light go at twice the speed of light and it led to his work uh, and he had to then interpret these endo trips or thought experiments into science um, Supposedly Newton had did these, Descartes, mm -hmm. Carrie Mullis, perhaps one way or another, or certainly Francis Crick, and some so many of these visionaries in science. And of course, in the arts, it's uh, abundant. Um, yeah. They call it the muse in, in, in the arts. It just comes to people. So I asked the question, now that we, we had gotten perhaps the solution to how life could have begun on the earth you know, we've got a working hypothesis that's testing it's being worked on by a dozen teams um what happened then and this will be of interest to the your viewers somebody uh, from a <clears throat> conference called the science of consciousness uh, which is held in tucson mostly mm -hmm. asked me to go and do a talk and i thought i don't know anything about consciousness you know I cracked one or two books about it and found it opaque and way overly described and no one seems to have defined the term. So it isn't a field per se because it's defined. And if you're a neuroscience, you study neurons. And um, I, I started doing more thought experiments and one came that showed how the origin of life itself was related to the conscious field that we live in. So I can't explain that, but I can possibly explain this and that the, the three properties that were cycling at life's origin built the biological world and they built our heads and our neurons and they built our societies and our technology and our culture. And that, so it's a general explainer. So we found this in another thought experiment, this three things, probability, tweaking, interconnection and messaging and memory. It's all you need. Just then they go in continuous cycle and they stack up and up and up and up and up and they create this, sort of field of interconnected huge amount of stuff and that we're sort of swimming in that field and that you can actually manipulate that field with intention which is a whole other topic yeah that is yeah i mean oh man there's so much yeah i so i originally was going to school for neuroscience so at the beginning i was submerged in neurons possibility it's all science blah blah, blah and not the understanding of the internal and external realities <clears throat> mirror and create one another often. And we can see these, these parallels or these plays from what's going on here to what's going on out there. I remember mm -hmm. um, having these experiences of like when I was a kid being like, Oh, I couldn't play a video game right now, but I would start to play it in my head and understand these things and go through these very similar thought experiments where I'm like, wait, it's up here. It's way cooler. And I could do it myself. So when I heard endo tripping, I was like, this is something that I think that I've been doing for a long time based on just the way that I think and move through things where I'll be like, yeah, I could have like an hour alone where I'm just sitting there, like just thinking about things and going through, trying to, uh, allowing these, these problems to solve themselves in 
the mind that is my my world. It's uh it's definitely something that I think um, most people don't don't completely comprehend. But when it comes to endo tripping, is there or endo endogenous tripping? Is there a way that you found where you can start to access that? And then once you understand the awareness, the feeling, the creation of it, actually start to tap into it to to utilize it as a tool for helping with everything that you're doing. Yeah, I. <clears throat> I found that what I do is I have a closely held dream of something happening like a, and my imagination, I allow my imagination to sort of say, what if I could, you know, build the greatest, whatever, digital representation of the solar system. You know, and this is a dream that I had in the nineties, mm-hmm. even in the eighties, well, not in the eighties, but the nineties. And like, wow, you could, you could model the surface of the moon, you could design rovers, you could figure out how spacecraft would move, how to mine asteroids for resources, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, wow, it'd be great to have a virtual solar system. And then I was so excited about it, I just let my imagination rip. Like, what if it's the best possible scenario? And then I waited because I knew that that type of dream and passionate things will bring in reality. Mm -hmm. It's like little little marbles will roll down into that valley that I just opened up, the valley of intention and imagination which makes this intentional valley. And they started appearing. So 98, uh, I was doing a virtual world uh, modeling the moon with the University of Cincinnati. So I went for that, like, oh, that's kind of close to my idea of virtual solar system. Pick that marble up. And then 99, there was the 30th anniversary of the moon landing and I met an Apollo astronaut named Rusty Schweikart. So I held an event where he would go into the virtual 3D moon world with all these avatar users and tell them about going to the moon. Then I got invited to a NASA, a conference where there was NASA people and in the front row was a chief scientist and I showed that world like, okay, that's the next marble. He was looking up and he came up to me and gave me ten, five years of funding project for project so i had started a company and i'd even called it digital space in 95 and so we started getting funding we had 25 projects from nasa and it was like we built the virtual solar system and we much better than my dream ever would have and each each along the way is an open-eyed awareness that the great cosmic inter- synchronous field that we're in uh, it responds to server requests. So some people call it prayer. Mm-hmm. Other people call it dreams. Other people, you know, call it hopes and wishes, but you can actually use it as a tool and you can shape it, <clears throat> especially now that we're getting more and more densely and con- interconnected. So within 10 minutes on a social media or a smartphone, I can make the personal connections that would have taken two years in the mid 90s right it's just like everything's just so accelerated and everyone's having the same thoughts at the same time just as they always have but now it's so fast because you reach that person within microseconds and so the synchronous field is super dense it's i think it's made by the living world it's not some kind of god or panpsychist mm-hmm. entity because the universe is mostly dumb it's the universe is mostly just clueless atoms and very unproductive after 13 billion years, but the living world is where the action is. Mm-hmm. And so this field that we're in, you know, I think of it's everything. I mean, that's our greatest tool that Homo sapiens has ever had is this intention. I call it in- intention or first imagination, imagining the best outcome, then intention on sticking with it, then attention where the little clues are rolling back f- from the server request, the great mm-hmm. whatever. And then action, where you pick them up and do something. And as ever you pick it up and it opens the next valley, which allows the next improbable thing to roll in. And suddenly you're in a miraculous place, which I found myself numerous times in the last 30 years uh, at the tops of these, these peaks of improbable achievement. Um, and then I just go for the next ridge and the next peak. And so now we're modeling how consciousness actually works from the lowest level. And it turns out 
this origin of life three-way thing may be a new Copernican revolution in the making because it actually explains just about everything. Uh, and I've been work, working with philosophers and talking to Ken Wilber and uh, all these people that talk, think about theories of everything. But this is a theory of everything, not from physics, but from the living world. I love it. Yeah, I mean, so with creating and understanding this concept that comes to you, how do you keep that in? I feel like there's always this this piece that's in the back of your mind as things are going on. Is it more of one of those things where you surrender to it? Or is it one of those things where as you apply the action and understand that what is going to happen from intention from the creation and everything, it's going to come into fruition. And then through that, I mean, year after year, allowing that to continue the process of, mm -hmm. to unfold yeah. over time. Yeah, and I, I think what we were getting to, and I, what I didn't get to quite, is that it, it, you know, this in, imagination, intention, uh, attention, and then action leads to these key moments where you get the download. You know, we know what download is from the Matrix, I think, or something, where you're sitting there, and you could be mowing the lawn, you could be walking your dog, you could be uh, doing, it happens to me in breath work and yoga a lot. Mm -hmm. You could be, it's full awake state, usually nothing to do with any kind of exogenous substance, although they can help. Uh, but you have to be careful. You have to be careful in that because the energies are just overpowering. Because this is a subtle system, not, an, not a high energy system. So then suddenly something starts coming on. And Einstein discovered his experiences as coming through his body. You know, you think of them, this guy with his wild hair <laughs> as a heady guy, but he was not. He was very embodied. I mean, the man played the violin. He was a very heartfelt man. He was, he was very present. Um, anyway, and he's a joker, too. Uh, so he would feel the insight coming through his body, and then it would appear to him as this vision or thought experiment. And so one day it will come. And when it comes, generally you're not distracted. So like leave your phone somewhere because that'll break the field. That will uh, not allow this to come on. And when it comes, it takes you over. So on, on one trip, a big flight to China where I had my good noise canceling headphones and the right music tracks. I find that spacey music really helps, not vocals. Uh, it came, there was a huge uh, endo trip began and it was me inside a watery world cycling as protocells between one energy system and, and, and a, a vent of water coming out on another. And it went on for 45 minutes. And I've, what happens when these things start and I closed my eyes to not have extra optical interference. Some people are just blank stare and their partners are like, yeah. hello, <laughs> you know, but I close my eyes and, and, and it runs, it runs with you. It, take, it takes you over. It's not your imagination. It's something coming from somewhere else from the synchronous field or whatever. And you, you just let go. I mean, it's pleasurable. I mean, and surprising because it's so vivid for in my case. And what I would do is go into the little observer sphere that I developed when I was nine and just observe, just be present to it. And as you said earlier, allow, you know, and submit to it, uh, not questioning it or anything, just enjoying it, really. And then what I can do is pause it every once in a while and open my eyes and draw in my notebook. And then go back, close, down, push the button and restart. And sometimes it's gone on. It's Now it's in cold water and you can ask it things. You're like, why are we in cold water? And it kind of non-verbally shows you, well, I'm showing you the beginnings of sexual reproduction. Mm. Okay, that's great. And it shows protocells merging in, the, in another state. And what I had to do, so that was a big one. That filled like 20 pages of drawings and stuff. Wow. And there's a point at which it slows down and it's no longer an endo trip. And you're sort of, what you have to do is graciously let it go. Don't try to push it with your imagination. It would be like pushing a string anyway. Let it go. Let it rest. Because that respects the boundaries of the process. 
Because if you come in like, oh, I got to do a little bit more and I'm going to use my imagination, you blur it. You could. Mm-hmm. I always thought you could screw it up. Just thank it and just let yourself go out of it when it, its timing appears. And then for me, uh, because I'm such a gearhead and I want things to work in the world, engineered things or solutions or science, mm-hmm. I would then take that vision to, in this case, my colleague at UC Santa Cruz and show it to him. This was before I met him even, and get it checked out because everyone can have visions, and the visions aren't not necessarily precisely matched to the world. And there's a lot of people who get into fantasy and they go mm-hmm. way off, and they they invent all these things that look like conspiracy theories because they had a download, and that's just wrong. It's just no, annoying, and it can confuse people, and it's a waste of, of resources. You got to take that thing and go and test it so i would take those drawings and i would show them to dave and say this is what i saw in a vision and and he said okay absolutely correct insight and very good but in the wrong setting we need to go through a drying cycle it's not all aqueous because the chemistry won't work if it's aqueous all the time we need to dry down and so that was a that vision was in 2000 eight or nine and then I met Dave and I showed him the notebook and he said you're right on um, the latest thinking having never studied that at all so but then then you refine and you refine and you refine and three years after that vision another one came that was now informed by a lot of science and a lot of experiment and it was it was much closer and much richer uh, mm-hmm. In fact, it led directly to a publication that's been cited 70 times or something now. Wow. Um, which announced this new hypothesis to the world in 2015, I think it was. So you you got to go and bring this into the world across that magic liminal ridge from the world of magic and downloads and stuff. Bring it across that ridge and you got to test it out and check it out and stuff is going to fall off of it. And then you can take the model back across into magic and have mm-hmm. the next thought experiment or the next visioneering session. But you, you can't just run with what comes in your head. You really got to, you got to take hammer and tongs to it. Totally. So it almost seems like the more that you learn, the more that you start to understand, the easier that it becomes for you to be able to interpret what is coming through. Is it- yeah. I mean, Dennis McKenna, I mean, he had a download about experiencing how photosynthesis worked, but only he could only do that because he understood plants. I mean, the man studies plants. Uh, yeah. He's a entheogenic plants, but, and so his download, his experience is going to be close to his knowledge base, but it's still going to blow him away. It's going to be beyond uh, his knowledge. I mean, nobody ever experienced photosynthesis in the way he describes it. Totally. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and I know um, when it comes to more of the cannabinoids, I know that you've been studying that as well. And how is the effect from that enhance what's going on with endotripping or is there an interplay with that? You know, in a funny way, I'm like Sasha Shulgin. Um, Not that I've done the amazing chemistry he's done, but I don't like cannabis really it really doesn't do anything for me i'm i'm in a kind of a highly excited state all the time and i find that cannabis takes my system offline that i'm kind of in a way i'm tripping all the time yeah. and there's sort of in, certainly sasha was like that and he found cannabis to be disturbing um which i do too i mean terence couldn't have lived without cam- cannabis for a yeah. second i mean so we're all built differently, our, our brain chemistries. I think in a way, um, and this is an experiment that I did years ago. Was like, the question was, where were these intense download or endotrips, where were they made from? And I think they're made from flushes of dimethyltryptamine or at least another, another stimulating compound that we can make endogenously. And I did A-B testing. And I won't describe it in detail for the audience because I'm you know, I'm, I'm not that type of a, of, yeah. a, of a person, but I think I verified that it was, that I was just flushing natural DMT into my system. 
And I think that little kids are doing it all the time. Yeah. And, you know, they talk about it having it at end of life at the pineal gland and all that, but I don't think there's been a whole lot of real science done on that. I think that that's, it's a hope and a dream that we'll find the connection, but definitely DMT is a real thing in the human body as it is in many plants and I think all animals. You know, Rick Strassman called it, it was the dream molecule or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've spoken to Rick about it. I've spoken to Sasha about it, about my system, that I have this ultra sensitive system that will flip over into that very easily. And Sasha at one point uh, said that if I, this, this is some chemistry for the audience. He said, if you ch checked your spinal fluid, you might find high levels of dimethyltryptamine in them, which I haven't done. Yeah. Um, but he predicted that. And then Rick Strassman said, if you took a, what's called an MAOI, monoamine mm -hmm. oxidase inhibitor, uh, it might allow your system to uh, ex not break down your natural tryptamine, but allow it to accumulate. And I tried that. I tried this kind of tea that's common. I think it was common in the Middle East called Syrian rue. Mm -hmm. And it worked. I mean, I went into an endo state, you know, very deep. I mean, very, because, you know, chemically it was just allowing a buildup of my own natural totally. tryptamine, if you will. And truthfully, Austin, I, I completely stayed away from psychedelics or even aspirin. Really? Uh, because, yeah, my system was so sensitive and I, I didn't want to mess up the natural ability I had to do this work. Uh, when I met Terrence, I decided to do experiments because Terrence and I were, were doing experiments together. Um, and I've since done more, but I would say that the majority of my work is what Terrence would have called on the natch. Um, which he didn't believe you could do this stuff on the natch, but <laughs> when he, when he was ill, uh, when he was suffering from his uh, tumor uh, toward the end of his life, you can hear this in an interview with uh, Eric Davis. It was conducted in November of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of 1999. He talks about that he was probably wrong uh, about the on the natch thing. He, that in fact, there were many ways, doorways into these extraordinary states and visions and things. And that, that he was really wrong about that. And, you could come into them through brain injury, through illness, mm -hmm. through um, chemical imbalances. Uh, he mentioned a few of them. But of course, you in, in, in meditation, you can come into them. In extreme sports, uh, you can. Uh, and I think it's there's many doorways. And to, to some extent, the psychedelic doorway is a tricky one because the psychedelic doorway, you know how if you're, walk into a pleasant house, right? You, they've got nice lighting mm -hmm. and, and they warmly welcome. When do you walk into a Safeway? <laughs> when you walk into a Safeway, like yeah. <laughs> the lighting just blasts your consciousness. You're overwhelmed by people with shopping carts and sounds and all these products and you're completely distracted. And, and psychedelics can be like that and they're not subtle often and people don't know how to navigate the Safeway if they've never been in one. And it's, it can be very experientially overloading. So to do work, I mean, to, I mean, this is why probably people like to smoke, mo mm -hmm. smoke weed. I mean, edibles are another thing. Edibles are like, they're as powerful as the psychedelics as far as oh, yeah. I'm, I'm concerned. It should be taken with extreme caution. But uh, yeah, psychedelics, they're, they're like a hammer on the, on the conscious system. And for many people, I don't think they're prepared to navigate the, the shards that are left uh, and the space that's opened. Mm. So it, in some sense, endo tripping is a nice medium uh, because it can, can deliver some of the most extraordinary things, but it's that I call it the human medicine. Mm. Uh, and, and it's endo tripping, I think has generated all the, the great art, music, writing, and much of the science and even engineering solutions. Uh, it's, um, it's described a little bit by James Fadiman, mm -hmm. uh, but he was tying, tying the creative process uh, to mostly people using LSD. But I think anybody who studies the creative process always wonders what is the source of this, these extremely amazing downloads. 
and I just came up with a name that I called endo tripping because it seems yeah. like it's a trip and uh, but it's a trip that goes somewhere uh, that you can really take somewhere and bring back yeah yeah I think it's something that uh, because now that I almost needed it consciously aware to understand what is going on which is I think um, you know one of the main things with most things in life is if you don't understand what's going on you're just like gibberish gibberish and these just messages come through and you're like, yeah, whatever. It's just, I've always daydreamed with my eyes open and done stuff like that. Mm. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to the understanding that regardless of if you try to take something to get somewhere, trying to force anything almost never delivers the results that you wanted to get. Mm. But instead being open and allowing whatever to come to you through download. Like I always talk to my subconscious mind. I'll ask it things. I was in the float tank literally three days ago. <laughs> and I knew at the beginning, normally music comes on at the beginning to start it and to end it. And I was in the float tank and I was like, the music didn't come on. I know for a fact, it's not going to come on when the hour is up and this could be super awkward. So I was like, subconscious mind, please just give me something when an hour is up so that I know to get out of the float tank. <laughs> I had this weird thought, I get out of it, I look at my phone, 59 minutes. I was like, boom. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think <clears throat> a lot of this is less of, don't force things, ask, and you will receive. But you'll receive it in a way that's like, something that you never really thought even was possible until I guess like the universe proves it to you. Yeah, beautifully said, that, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, it's an endo tripping, the concept. So in order to, to start to understand it, it's really to, to follow those thought trails that you didn't think that you originally wouldn't put time into. Is that how you would say to, to begin the process of exploration? Yeah, and it's like all of us have dreams in our lives. And, you know, most of us, for some whatever reason seem to be swayed away from dreams you know life interferes you know you have debt you have a relationship change you have a health change whatever um and so we kind of swerve around and choose new dreams but i think if you um if you sort of have a closely held dream that you stick with and the atten intention and attentions on it no matter what happens in your life, it's kind of like a holding a talisman. It's a mm -hmm. little object that it's precious to you and you never give it up. And if you talk to people who've been in, in prison, they may Nelson and Mandela, I mean, all his years yeah. in prison, I mean, he held on to the talisman that there will be freedom one day for, you know, black South Africans, colored South Africans, and that justice will be done. And he treated, he was treated with decency, actually, in, in, in the prisons. And he continued his education. I mean, he got degrees from UNISA, and so did the other political prisoners. And they did their cricket on the radio thing. And But he kept holding to it, no matter what happened. And by gosh, you know, in 1994, 93, 94, the miracles happened. And he was just, you know, wasn't too old, and he could come and lead the nation. But he had, it's because he had held that through all mm -hmm. things. And that I think in some ways, because Nelson Mandela held to that in the 13 years in prison and Robben Island and other places, that it actually set up the conditions to arise, to have, have his dream come into reality. It set up the conditions. Um, because everything's connected. So his intention and his ongoing at attention on what is happening in South Africa now and the political situation and tracking and discussing it sets up a dynamic to open a possibility that was considered inconceivable, you know, but if he'd lost hope and, and he'd given up and gone some other direction, I think that uh, it would have a ripple effect and, and that never would have happened. And then of course he held that talisman so beautifully that when he came out of prison, he was this glowing being. Mm -hmm. But he was also very humble and he was very realistic about how to handle this very dynamic, crazy situation. 
but he was ready. He was completely ready for that leadership to come. And so that's one example of, I think, a good example. Totally. Yeah, it's almost like um, in the study of hermetic philosophy, uh, when you start to understand the ups and downs of things, then you can basically keep yourself baseline so that you don't, even if there is an up and down, it doesn't affect you completely. So you can hold that, that constant, okay, this is where I'm trying, this is where I'm going to be. And the, the rhythms, oh, I forget what it's called. There's like seven laws <laughs> I don't remember at this point, but one of the laws is like, they, they have a whole section on free will and they're like, yeah, but if you understand the laws of rhythms and this and that, then like during the low points, essentially, you can keep your internal state high. Mm -hmm. And then that is what allows you to get to the next place. And there's, there's new work in the healing arts that I've been involved with recent years that is a really good underlying substructure behind all of this, which is that human beings, as Marvin Minsky described, are a society of mind. There's many parts of us moving around. Sometimes it's called subpersonalities. Eckhart Tolle called it the pain body in some cases. There's now internal family systems. It's called parts work where a human's an OS. And so if you're in a depression state, it's because there's actually a, not only just one part, but a series of parts. And Gabor Mate talks about all this. Yeah. There's a part that's super wounded from very early childhood. And there's a part that's protecting that wound to block any further wounding. Then there's, a, there's parts attached to it that are doing, that are coping mechanisms, that are uh, they're doers or they're managers. So when you get close to somebody's triggering of their wound, they, their personality changes into this protector mode. Mm -hmm. And this is what Eckhart Tolle discovered in all of his sessions that he did with people, that he could trigger them into what he called unconscious you know, expressions where they would start screaming because it was the part that was now taking them over and he had recordings going so he could play it for the client so they could hear what it sounded like when there was a triggered uh, response and it was shocking to his clients because they had no memory yeah. of that. And that's, that's become very refined in the last 20 years. And I'm in a group called Luminous Awareness and we work a hundred of us at once for five days for four times a year and uh, we have we have 65 students that are all very, very advanced practitioners in their own right. And we work on these wounded parts and we trigger ourselves. We trigger like 30, 40 people at a time into the protector response. And then we work there with their systems and allow their systems to work it through all with a group kind of energy mm -hmm. swirling around that is the human medicine, whatever it is. And it works. I mean, people get released. Uh, so 10 years in psychotherapy and 10 years taking SSRIs didn't solve their depression, but they were, and, and even going to ayahuasca totally. for temporarily, but, but this kind of work has the, has a potency to it um, because you're in a community. You're not sitting alone. You're other people are checking in on you and it's the way we healed in the past. We did it in group and tribe and, you just can't do it in a doctor's office. You can't do this kind of work sitting on a pillow meditating by yourself and trying to work your system. You need group. And, and, and we need understanding even from neuroscience about parts and triggered traumas, rigid traumas, and you know, totally. the schizoid response. It's all in the DSM, for goodness sakes, now. So, so we're, humanity's got amazing tools now. Um, to, to work on our own suffering that the, the Buddha talks about. Um, our goal is to reduce, eliminate, reduce suffering so that all beings don't, don't suffer. And what they meant by suffering isn't necessarily that you have a scratch you can't itch or an itch you can't scratch, yeah. but it's actually the, the cycling internal thoughts um, that drive you crazy and that they're constantly, and they're, they're coming from wounded parts. And perhaps, I don't think the Buddha understood that in his day, but now we do. And we can bring people into fully awakened states free of those terrible cycling thoughts. And to some extent, as I was saying originally, there's a substructure under, under endotripping because <clears throat> endotripping is an amazing discernment, almost a crystalline knowing layer 
that gives you flashes of insight. Like last weekend, I found one of my parts that was always hiding and trying to protect me. And it was the, is super young. It was like infant, infant age. And it, I'd never seen it. And it had been pushing the button on my doers chronically so that I would do too much and I would get exhausted. So the person I was working with, I asked her the question, what is pushing the button on the doers? Just another thing. And then I saw it. It was a hidden part. And then I went into almost an end, really an endo state and asked it the question, where are you from? And I sort of welcomed it because it had been a hidden part of me that had been creating a cycling anxiety for my whole life. And the flash that came out of that part was the little baby in the crib, basically abandoned as I was given up at birth, you know, mm -hmm. in an adoption ward for two weeks. And that was, I, and I, wow, I zoomed into that baby and the baby was uncomfortable moving around. The babies can't move very much when they're a couple of days old, but it didn't know that it had, something was wrong. It knew something was wrong, but it didn't know why. Mm -hmm. It left the protection of the womb and you're supposed to go to the mother. Otherwise, it's a big shock. And the baby was actually just left, uh, attended by nurses. But then the baby was, something in its psyche was moving around and discomfort, not knowing why. And that was that part. So using endo, I was able to see that. I was open, as, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. uh, open and aware to the download that came from, or the upload that came from that part. And I was a flash of insight. Oh, my goodness. This is a fundamental part of me that's been cycling for 57 years. And now it can come to rest. And suddenly my whole system relaxed as this, as this entity just came into relaxation because it was seen for the first time. And now the, and this has only been five days, so who knows if I'll be, you know, recidivist and go back. But I'm not being hammered anymore by the doer because the thing that was pushing the button of the doer is taking a break for the first time. Totally. Wow. Yeah, I mean, oh, man, there's so much in that. But it, it's it's almost like the, the concept of... Uh, letting go from uh, Richard Hawkins uh, where he's essentially talking about when you have these things, you have to become aware of the thing that is going on. And once you're aware of that, you can finally see that it's gripping in some way. And it's just the act of knowing that it's doing something, which allows you to then get to relaxation. I, I notice that in myself a lot. And I, I have, plenty of internal work to do through a lot of different areas uh i i know that because every time i do it i realize how much more there is uh, yeah and, and there there is an end point uh, which is the beautiful thing it, and often in healing practice because they're therapeutic not curative because you're feeling better after mm -hmm. the practice but you don't know if you got anywhere and it's a sort of a therapy it's like taking you know a, a medication really and that's what most of the the healing arts is about it's about giving temporary relief you know yeah. temporary pain relief like excedrin or something uh, the harder thing is to as you say the discernment to actually coming to know what is going on in your system and sometimes it can take most of a lifetime like it has with me because i had to literally reconstruct and, and effectively re-experience my conception, the growth in my mother's belly, my birth, my experience at birth, all my childhood experiences and stack them together and come mm -hmm. to know them through all kinds of means to find out how I booted up. The boot code tape. Totally. And finally got that boot code tape. It's like, wow, that explains this response and that response and this tendency to want to go and eat sugar all the time or to go for comfort here or you know, or to withdraw here. And finally, after decades, or maybe it could be shorter these days, and help from people that really can track your system and look inside your system, you can come to know yourself and like, know thyself. I think yeah. some St. Augustine or somebody said, you know, getting closer to God is actually knowing who you really are. Totally. You know, 
and 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 you get to that point and then the releases start to come and Eckhart Tolle called it the return that you're you're no longer expanding out and egos driving and achievement and accumulation you start your return back to really resting the system and and resolving the knots untying them and resolving and then you're what he would maybe call you're more of a spiritual mode but it really is that you're not being driven necessarily hard by your internal processes you've come to terms with those processes and maybe the processes drove you to the point like they have with me where i achieved my life goals you know four or five years ago i achieved my two life goals which was to figure out how life began on the earth and how to give it a pathway into the cosmos and, and the two inventions to my mind on that day in April 15th, 2015, 15, 15, uh, wow. when I did the two TEDx talks on the one day, when I walked out of that, I said, I'm done. You know, I was 53 or I don't know, 52 years old and something like that. And realized I'm finished because those were the objectives I had when I was a teenager and they're done. And I through all this following of probabilities and endos and things like this, and everything else has been gravy since then. But, um, you know, really, truly part of my life's work is to unwind my system so that the hard driving factors that led me to achieve those goals no longer rule my life. Because they just drive you crazy. They cause burnout. <laughs> they, you know, people get burned out. I mean, they, they, the systems get blown up by this overdriving thing from the maybe the rigid personality disorder, which is a, another wound that's very common in our society. The parent that never was satisfied with the child's performance. The tiger moms are very, very, very traumatic for totally. children. Terrible, terrible. Uh, but then some, then you let it go and you can kind of rest in, and let your whole system become human again, be a human being instead of a human doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's one of those things that I, being at my age, I often think about <clears throat> why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I care so much? Because there's there's so many things where I'm like, this doesn't even like, I'm so, I put so much importance on something and I'm like, but what is it? Why is this something that I truly think, I have my hands in money pots because I like to just do a lot of different things but I'm always like well why do I want to do this what is even the point and I think that is something especially now I mean you see it right now with the hustle the grind just keep going culture where it's like the burnout happens and mm -hmm. then they burn out and they're like I never should have done that before and then like five years later they're burning out again yeah and it, it's just a, a perpetual cycle created by something that they don't understand because they don't allow it to come to fruition or at least to expose itself of what it is. Then, then people blow their fuse box panel door off, you know, cause this explosion is so big and then they blow <laughs> out and they go out and they reset and you know, there's that path and there's the people who have to go to Burning Man every year to, to keep, in health actually it's a healthy thing or go to esalen or yep. or something um they do what they do but you're right i mean then the pot then it just fills up again and the tendency i have is to take on more projects mm -hmm. you know because i'm like still have this vestige of like well i haven't done anything you know and or i'm about to be in financial doom or destitution which is not far off, but I always know that something's gonna gonna come because I've just changed uh, changed my my companies, and I'm starting a couple of new companies. Oh, awesome! Uh, and so I'm in an in between state, but uh, this time around, I'm 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 old enough that I'm finding younger people that will drive them as the CEOs and and do the kind of backbreaking work because there really isn't any way around it. I mean, mm -hmm. to start a bioscience venture. Or a, uh, we just had a meeting at Google two days ago, and Google was so enthused at this idea that uh, basically they tapped the 21-year-old, wonderful, uh, brilliant student that I brought along and said, "Start a company." Yeah. 
and Google will finance it. You know, if you were able to achieve blah de blah for NASA and and he's like, Oh my god, I woke up this morning as a twenty one year old undergrad with you know, <laughs> really you hadn't gotten enough sleep and then this evening I'm starting a company and Google's gonna back it. It's like what a that's his yeah. time of life. That that'll be his time of life to to burn that midnight oil to be driven by all of his parts and his insecurities. Uh, but to go and I'll be there as a mentor and a guide, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't have to burn myself out. I'm mean, fortunate that I've, I've gotten to that point where I don't have to. And many people are still climbing out of debt when they're mm -hmm. 60 or 70 or something. And they're still trying, I mean, there's a cost of putting kids through school and oh, it's yeah. a ridiculous society. It's, yes. you know, going to Australia or back to Canada, you find much more sanity because the, the, the society takes care of its people and it, it prioritizes children, you know, here it just abuses families and children. It's, you know, you have to be really careful here um, but, in the, in the U S of a. Yeah. 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 It's very interesting. Yeah. I dropped out of college. I was going for neuroscience and got picked up by a health and fitness startup and started that marketing aspect while kind of trying to understand who I was and what I wanted out of things. And so I got to mitigate the financial burden that would come from college, mm. but not the education that would come from life. And so right. that's one of those things that, I mean, I would say I read probably 500 times more than most college graduates because that's like all I want to do is like read, learn, listen to books, do all that interconnect ideas i think exactly what you're saying for me now i definitely am burning the midnight oil and trying to create something mm -hmm. um but it's with the the knowingness that later in time i'll understand why and i'm okay not understanding why now and i think that's the hardest thing is to accept the unknown yeah and i certainly i had to live with it i mean for 30 years I had these dreams of working on these <clears throat> these two missions and I was going all over the place I mean I lived in Czechoslovakia I lived in wow. different parts of the states I bopped around I was literally homeless for a while living in a van you know, driving around looking for where should I live and who should I work with and you know just complete unknown but complete uh, kind of jokerly confidence that it would work out. And once in my twenties, when I was, you know, in kind of a really messed up situation in between one college thing and another, and where I'd run out of funding and I would be just going to run out of my student visa and I wouldn't be able to stay in Los Angeles. It was like this really shaky period. And I asked the field, okay, dude, you know, I'm supposed to be doing these things and you've guided me this far when is it going to happen? I mean, when, when am I going to have these breakthroughs? And it said to me very clearly in your fifties. Mm -hmm. So be patient, you know, be patient. So I took, I took that in as like, okay, so in my fifties, so there's this long period of lining of stuff having to line up. Mm -hmm. And when it happened in my fifties, I did a retrospective and looked at these two threads going back and realized, of course, there's no way that I could have come up with that breakthrough and that breakthrough mm. when I was 52, unless there would have been an amazing amount of stacking of lining up of things. So if there's a cosmic intelligence, it had to need time, needed time to mature fields and space and mature the origin of life field and get me to move to the right place in California. That was 30 minutes from my one collaborator and my other for the mm. two projects. It needs to line up so much and they moved in at the right time. And so that I can move in and be, meet them both at the right time. And then boom, boom, boom. And there was no way that the, the, this, this, this synchronous field had like, okay, you made the server call and I've got all this stuff to do to make this request happen. And it took 30 years and it, but it, but it did, it worked, but it had to take 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for anything, there's, if you walk with knowingness 
and you allow things to come into place, they will. But if you try to force it, kind of like what we were talking about a minute ago, yeah. with people going to get help, they're like, or they're ending up at Esalen, or they're going to Burning Man constantly, and they're trying to take ayahuasca all the time and LSD, and they're like, I need to break through, I need to break through, I need to break. They can't because that's not what a breakthrough is. It's not how it works. It's like I had this concept a while ago where like most people are like trudging to success. They're trying to get there. But the best way to get to success is falling into it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to like climb the mountain to get to success. You want to like have everything set up and be open and then just fall into success. It's the same thing with everything when it comes to breakthrough and when it comes to being open to life and what goes on. And just try to really be purely yourself. Uh, a good example, this is Robin Williams. So I, I never watch TV. I don't, I don't watch news. I have no, no interest in any of it. It's just like complete, you know, poppycock. It's anxiety <laughs> inducing. And I stopped watching TV in 1991 because I figured it was cycling. The news was always the same stories. Mm -hmm. And there were people manipulating me and trying to, you know, put anxiety in my system, which I didn't want to have. And I was going to waste millions of hours. So I shut it off. And sometime in the 2000s, I shut off web news. So I don't ever see, I have no idea what's going on in politics, yeah. nothing. Unless I meet someone personally or travel to an area of the world, I don't have any knowledge filtered yeah. through media. So, uh, you know, that created a clarity that of independence. So then I couldn't be wavered off. Like people would say, well, you know, the world's going to blow up tomorrow. So there's no point in doing anything, but I don't know the world's going to blow up tomorrow. I'm just going from yeah. my local experience and that's a much more subtle and better, better guide. And so <clears throat> it was easier for me not to waver because I wasn't getting all the noise, you know, People come here and they say, oh, it's the worst of times in the world. And I think, <laughs> wow, you know, who put that thought into your head? Because I've just traveled the entire world in the last year. And I've yeah. seen things improving everywhere. I've seen just tremendous, you know, of course, there's people working in terrible factory conditions and whatnot. But for the most part, humans, this is the best time we've ever had on the earth. And, and these people are under the spell of some you know, d demonic force called us that is extracting from them by feeding them all this negative and crazy making narrative. But I just, I just have no context. I have no context in it. So I think that that's also really important to oh, yeah. clarity of dream is just, just like a Jedi, like a samurai block, all that stuff out because the culture, you know, Terrence, used to have this saying which i think is apropos that culture is not your friend mm. i mean some some culture is your friend you know your community and and the healthy aspects of culture from a long time ago but modern culture driven by commercialism is not your friend it's it's really your enemy um and, and you know yes it's good to order stuff on amazon and it comes but commercial <laughs> advertising is not your friend it is it is a force of manipulation and, and power and, and bad psychology, most of it, 99%. Shyat Day uh, created one of the great advertising agencies, uh, wrote a great article about this saying, we have created a monster that is the stealer of dreams, you know, the destroyer of personalities in advertising. And he wrote yeah. this about 20 years ago. So why pay any attention to it? Why why give it any 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 credibility totally yeah i mean it's when you look at the amount of money that these that certain brands have what they can do to essentially create and solidify messages like this is what beauty is or this is what this is they have the money to essentially reach people enough times to cement into their being this is what this is the way it is and then from that, you know, humans, we operate under the, I am who I think you think I am principle. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so when we operate from that, but we're operating not even from the people that we know, we're operating from the media and the things that we think that we should know, that we come into this weird, like no man's land of like, I don't even know who I am because I think that 
I am who the media person, who's just some random person spending money trying to enforce a narrative, which is mainly around some sort of conversion event, thinks that I should be. And yeah, yeah, and it's 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 tr- truly. Uh, I, I sat beside a guy on a flight. I was going to the Middle East in January, and I was lucky enough to sit beside a Professor Gross, G R O S S. I forget his. I think he's Larry Gross uh, from University of Southern California Annenberg School of Communication, which I went to in the eighties. Oh wow! And he has a he's studied this you know for decades. His his brother won the Nobel Prize. His father wrote a book called Friendly Fascism in 1980 that predicted all this sort of craziness uh, that government is doing. Mm-hmm. It's like fascism with a friendly face. And you can read the book and it's been reissued. And, but anyway, so he, he talked about all this stuff as, as a form of pollution in the environment. Mm. You know, the smog is pollution, that there's noise pollution, there's light pollution. Yeah. There's trash, there's pollution of waters, but this is a form of pollution that we're allowing our, ourselves and our children to be subjected to. And it's dangerous. It has health effects yes. uh, that are well chronicled and that as a society, should we uh, wake up to this, that we can't allow this. And in Singapore, uh, they have these strict standards on what goes into advertising and what goes Mm -hmm. on the airways, which of course are impossible to control because of YouTube and stuff. Yeah. But at least, you know, in one place and somebody might call it censorship, but they basically said, no, if you subject children to violent shooting movies where 30 people get killed horribly, they become desensitized to that. Yeah. But a deep part of their subconscious is, is wounded. You have no right to do that. That's, that's not just pollution. That's a criminal offense yeah. uh, against the population. And I have friends that worked at Pixar and Lucas and you know, wherever. Yeah. Um, th- these places that finally they burned out. I mean, they've made so many violent CG films that left them completely cold. They worked on 15 projects and said, I cannot look at another one of these things. They make me sick. So if, if, people are who are the artists and technologists making these films are realizing this is just really bad um and i got to get out of here it's toxic uh we're doing something wrong and we as a society ought to recognize that it is a form of pollution and it's a form of crime and uh it's time for it to stop and we can stop it totally yeah i mean i was even i saw a band last night and they had a bunch of uh I guess like trippy imagery and stuff like that. But a lot of it was like devil focus and like getting like weird. And I was like, I don't know if I came for this or more of like the music that was going on. Cause I don't want to, I guess mental pollution is probably the most prevalent thing there is today. Especially, I mean, how everyone talks the way that verbiage and language ends up going and what we become used to. And with kids, it is started. I mean, I know, for instance, when I was a kid, I played with guns all the time. Uh, not like real guns, like like Star Wars. That was my thing. But uh, it definitely is some strange, possibly narrative, possibly uh, injected piece into who we start to become. Because yeah. It will, yeah. It will readily it's, available. You know, they say that... Uh, the best if you ride a motorcycle and i don't i don't but family members do what you do is if you're going to survive on a motorcycle and that means driving in between cars stop cars and traffic Mm -hmm. what you do is you realize that where the drivers 10 cars down where the driver is looking is where their attention is and it's where their front wheel is going to be turning Mm. And you, you study that front wheel because that is a difference in life or death that you're going to, you're going to go over your handlebars and get destroyed on the, on the pavement because someone's tried to change lanes and turned right in front of you and you're driving, you know, 25 miles an hour faster than they are because they're practically stopped. So, <clears throat> you know, people in that circumstance understand that 
where humans' attention is directed is where they go, sometimes fatally. And, and this is what happens with advertising and political nonsense and lie telling that is going on. Yeah. And I met a, a, a wonderful man, uh, Admiral Norman Hayes, when I was in, in Qatar. And <clears throat> it's strange, this hippie scientist from California meets this first black admiral. Right. Totally different worlds. But I really like military people. I've done work with them for 20 years. I've, they're straight up. They're, they're honest. They're, they're clear. They're, they, have, they have training how to be humans, really, in a way. Yeah. And we got along really well. And what we came up with was this dangerous distraction that has taken over our world uh, must end. And the way to end it is to point out and he can start with the Department of Defense, and I can start with whatever I do, is that the America, America that we know is under attack, and it's going to be sea level rise. And we, we have to stop building walls to wall ourselves off from Mexico because we're going to need to build seawalls, and we're going to need to let every Latin American Mexican worker in because we're going to need to spend a trillion dollars, and we need, we need millions of skilled labor, which they have, uh, hard working labor oh, yeah. to build uh, sea, what, sea level rise uh, measures everywhere. And this came up because I said, and one of the first things I said to him was because we were looking across a bay at a new city that Qatar had built and realized that all of it's going to be rusting girder work at 30, 40 years because it's right at sea level. Yeah. And they just had a rainstorm there that had flooded the entire place as they did not build drainage because it's a desert. And the royal family realized we screwed up because we don't even account for sea level rise. And look, we're investing 500 billion in infrastructure here. Uh, <clears throat> it's ridiculous. And I had been in a meeting where Google, Apple, and Facebook had asked the city, the county of San Mateo, we have built 20 billion in new campuses. And I was at one of those campuses two days ago at Google at sea level. And they're going to be destroyed if we get a three foot, four foot rise in sea level and a storm and a high tide and we're going to lose them. What are you doing about it? And the county of San Mateo said, uh, we're just a little weak county, you know, that we yeah. have our little problems. We haven't thought about it. And Google said, we'll start because, and we're willing to invest in this thing. So Admiral Hayes has said, we need to be designing throughout the 20s, uh, designing the abatement strategies, the change in agriculture that's coming, uh, everything. And then we need to be building in 2030. If we're not building in 2030, we're screwed. Yeah. And because it's gonna take 30 years to do this thing. And so he says, look, it could be a new mission for the Department of Defense to defend America, not these fake, ridiculously wasteful things like the war on terror or the war on drugs or whatever it was that he lived through and he saw the pointlessness of it. We've got a real thing that we have to do and we got to stop with all the nonsense and get to work. And what he proposed to do is hold a national convention. Uh, I propose that we should be in New Orleans because New Orleans is going yeah. to be gone. There's okay. no way to save New Orleans. You can't save a city that has flooding from both directions, from the Mississippi yeah. and, the, and the Gulf. You just can't, you can't build a levee. And the Army Corps of Engineers would say, you tell us how to build a levee that is going to save this city. Mm -hmm. We cannot figure it out. It's going to be gone. And so that convention would bring all the grassroots movements and all the federal movements and force the creation of a new agency at the federal level to, to do this job. The biggest mobilization in the history of the country even bigger than the interstates and do this thing so that we can preserve half of our infrastructure, all of our agriculture and our way of life. And we have a shot at having a, a stable and sane society in 50 yeah. to 60 years and still doing science and still having podcasts like this. Otherwise there's gonna be so many people on the move. And I, I told him about this whole vision, you know, the Bay area enclave vision, the enclave is controlled access, uh, to the Bay Area because it's basically walled off because it has a high way of life and there's refugees everywhere and you can't let them in. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of thing, this is an alternate future. Uh, and he was saying, we just can't allow that to happen. 
we've got to get together. We've got to get everybody at the table and into cities shouldn't be doing their own thing and becoming city states. It just, you know, it completely went against the grain of this military man who'd spent his entire life trying to protect and, and develop, protect the United States and develop it. And this was his job. And he saw all the complete waste. Well, he said, now we can do it. Now we can, we can do this thing. Mm-hmm. So I wrote him an email on Monday saying, I just so respect you. And do you accept that mission? Because you yeah. should go on the daily show. Oh, Nobody yeah. can attack you. I mean, forget about me. And then today I go and bet, pick up the mail in this week's New Yorker. The cover shows a cartoon, you know, stupid, you know, non-president standing on the White House yeah. holding a sign that says, build my wall. And around the White House is completely inundated, you know, with yeah. sea level rise. Like there's nothing left of Washington. You know, so it is in the zeitgeist. It's 2019. The 2020s could be this decade, this incredible decade. So I'm looking for anybody out there, including yourself, Austin, uh, yeah. that can get this word out. Because, you know, if, if Admiral Hayes can go and make this a national movement, it has to have the local movements already lined up. And the, the key oh. infrastructure people, climate people, agriculture people, cities all lined up so that when Hayes, if he accepts his mission, he goes on the Daily Show and, and makes an incredible impression. Mm-hmm. They're going to be saying Hayes for president, but he doesn't want that. He wants, he yeah. wants us to actually start taking action and stop with this nonsense because it, it, it's wartime. And totally. we're going to lose parts of the country and the world will see us as their example and they'll, they'll copy it. Qatar will build their seawall. China will do their abatement. We have to do it. I mean, the melt rates are there. You yeah. know, it's just, it's too late. I mean, there's nothing you can do about, about what's going on. So it's, it's the, the gigatons of water is coming and it's, it's, it's entering now and the sea level rise is occurring. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot more about getting ahead of the curve. Yeah. And he, he's a forward planner for the Pentagon. He worked in, in, in military intelligence and his whole life is about I just believe in long-term planning. That's all I do. So I said, man, I'm, I'm with you. And you're the guy. And we'll see how he responds. I yeah. haven't heard back from him yet. Awesome. Well, let me know how he responds and how I and anyone listening can help. Because it's your generation. You know, it's, yeah. Exactly. It's uh, a big undertaking, but we all got a hero's journey. All, everyone's got the hero's journey that requires some some things that no one thought they were ever going to do, which is what the hero's journey normally is. Then yeah. that's exactly what we should be doing. Yeah, and uh, I think this endo endo tripping, and maybe there's a better word for it, this endogenous endo tool. Uh, you use it, I use it, probably millions of people out there use it, and I think it's the greatest tool for our that's ever had put put in the hand of homo sapiens because it's a tool i think that shapes the future and it can bring complex solutions into view and then it can network people together so you have intuition tells you like uh, told me oh go talk to this this very upstanding black man over there in our group in qatar you know i felt something go and talk to him now and i did and it led to this, you know, just at the very beginnings. But this endo thing, this, whether it's intuition or downloaded visions or whatever it is, is our great, it's our great uh, birthright uh, legacy or future tool for our survival and thrival. Totally. Yeah, I mean, and anyone who's skeptical, uh, one thing that I always challenge people on, because skeptics, of course, have the most malleable minds, is to uh, get really relaxed and just ask your subconscious mind to wake yourself up at a specific time the next morning and uh, just watch because you'll get up at that exact time even if you didn't know what time it was. So it's, uh, it's a little prover in uh, how the universe and, and these things inside of you can come to fruition in reality. One of my neighbors here is Nick Herbert, who's a well-known physicist uh, and somewhat conscious 
re consciousness researcher in a way, and his wife, Betsy, used to say to him, Nick, I don't believe in the energy. I rely upon it. Ooh, I love that. I love that. Well, Bruce, before we sign off, is there, how can we find you? And besides the, uh, the mission that you've endowed on us, what else would you like to ask from, uh, from the viewers of the podcast? Well, I'm pretty easy to find uh, Bruce Damer, D-A-M-E-R. If you go to damer.com, you'll find a pretty crappy website, which I would appreciate help from somebody to make a good WordPress site. But I can has... help with whatever you need. That's oh, most, gosh. most of my day to day. Well, that would be wonderful because it's like, <clears throat> anyway, it, you'll see it. It's just a made in Dreamweaver, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it has links. It has the TEDx talks. And if you in fact Google Bruce Damer, you'll find a, so much stuff. That's it's amazing. And I think that they, you know, I think it's like the Bobby Farron thing. What is it? Be happy. What did he say? Remember that? Tim? Yeah. Tim? No. Anyway, uh, I think that people. It's an amazing universe, <clears throat> and we are one of the most amazing creations of this cosmos. We're totally on uh, improbable. Yeah. And, and you could think of it as here's universe A, like universes are blobs and, and a cartoon and universe B. And universe A says to B, uh, hey, listen, somebody invented the smartphone inside of me. What do I do? <laughs> and the universe B says, oh, my God. That's amazing. The, that the smartphone wasn't have, supposed to have started for a billion more universes when cetaceans or cephalopods became intelligent because they changed their skin color and that the whole octopus becomes a phone, right? And they, <laughs> yeah. like Terence used to talk about. But what's happened? Oh, crazy monkeys have done it that have short lives and hot blood and and all these these psychological parts and it's driven them so hard that they've invented the smartphone which is like the great igniter of whatever yeah. for universes like the smartphone is here what do we do <laughs> <laughs> so we are that i mean we are the remarkable greatest creation of nature um, and certainly highly improbable I, I study where life can start and i study exoplanets and i help with the next Mars rover to decide, <clears throat> present the case for where to land it to look for signs of life on Mars. And, and we are just extraordinary. Um, we're walking miracles, every one of us. Uh, right. and, and it's just, you know, just sort of pausing for a moment and considering how remarkable, even though we have mundane lives, we think we have mundane lives, that even those lives are extraordinary in the history of the cosmos. And, and that our minds are extraordinary, our bodies, our emotions, our, our energies, our, our capacities. And, uh, you know, the human potential movement did have something. You know, it had something going for it, realizing that human potential is, 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 is really not, not finite. It's not containable. Yeah. Uh, and it's the best thing we got going. And our, our attitude, our, our, our sense of lightness and levity. This is why my podcast is called The Levity Zone. Oh, awesome. I'm about, I'm about to get back to it and do my 70th episode. Awesome. Um, we, should, we should allow ourselves some levity and some gratitude and some gravity. Um, and we're living the best of times for humans. We have all these products and we, get, we can get dental work done. You know, <laughs> we can travel on airplanes to really cool places and, and we can meet people over zoom sessions and like this and it's seamlessly for an hour and a half and record a beautiful conversation to share. I mean, it's a miraculous time. It's the best time. I wouldn't want to be living in any other decade. It is. It is amazing. And I love that message. Realize that you are now and there's basically unlimited things that you can do. Yeah. And just enjoy being, enjoy existing. No. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Bruce. You're so welcome, Austin. Sorry it took so long, but we did it. Oh, we got it. And that's all that matters. 